Hello, I'm Dusty, and I'm proud. I'm also here to tell you that friendship is uh, one of the most important things, but I think it's especially important at your age because you're figuring out um, what it means uh, to be a good friend, uh, what it means uh, to, to know what a good friend is so you can have those good friends in your life, but also how to be a good friend. This is really, really important. So you learn how to become a good friend. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, but just a quick word on who to be friends with, because the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, and the Bible says this because it's true. I mean, it's not necessarily true because the Bible says it, but it says bad friends or bad friendships corrupt good character, and that's true, and here's what I've learned about you working with people your age for a long time. You already know this. You argue against it sometimes with parents or pastors or older people or whatever, but that's usually just to get what you want in that moment, and I, I get that. But you know this is true. Like, I've learned that you know this. So here's my little statement about who you should be friends with. Be friendly with many, but be friends with the few who share your values. And it kind of rhymes. I'm going to say it again. Be friendly with many, but be friends with the few who share your values, the things you believe in deeply the most. And for those of you that are followers of Jesus, that's the number one value on the list. Now, learning to be a good friend is really learning how to be a better person. The better person you learn to be, the better friend you're going to become. And friends don't let friends stay down. That's what we're going to talk about today. But I want to tell you about a time when I wish one of my friends would have stayed down. I came to, I became a Christian when I was a senior in high school. I didn't grow up in church, and, um, and I had, you know, a little bit of a, a, a rough past. I came to know Jesus, and like, look. I'm just going to be honest, you can think this is arrogant or whatever, I, I just, you know, I'm a lot older and I just don't care at this point, I'm not trying to make as many friends, <laughs> okay, but like, when I, when I accepted Christ, it changed me, I went from darkness to light, right, and I understand there's all kinds of different ways of coming to know Jesus, and in some ways it's, it's even more difficult to grow up in the Lord as my boys are growing up in the church and in the Lord, but it changed me. And so, like, I quit drinking, and I did that all the time, not just on weekends, almost every night for about three years. And, like, and and so my friend Brad and Corey showed up at my house one night and said, hey, come to this party with us. I didn't go to parties anymore. And they said, come on, Frizzell, just come with us. We're not going to drink at all. We'll just go hang out. And so I said, okay, I'll go. And I actually decided, now I'd already shared the Lord with these two yahoos, but I decided I'm going to go, I'm going to go share Jesus with the people at the party. I learned something that night. It's really hard to evangelize with people who are drunk, right? And, but the story I want to tell you is my friend Brad, uh, he's big, super tall, um, and and a big guy and and very uh, cocky. And uh, he walked through on a sidewalk to the, into the party where a group of people were hanging out and one of the guys there, and they took up the whole sidewalk so much that you'd have to walk around them in the grass, which I did, Right? Brad did not. Brad walked right through them with chest out and arms a little wider. And him and one guy bumped like, like cool guys do, right? Bump in you, try to make yourself a wall. I don't, anyway, so like, and then, and then long story short, they end up going to the street and, and having it out, right? And at some point, this other kid put on these brass knuckles that had a spike on the, on the, in the middle. And he punched Brad um, right outside the eye, went in and out and blood, and it was nasty, and Brad fell down, and the kid, you know, handed the brass knuckle off, and I got in the middle of him, and I'm like, okay, we're done. Let me get my, my guy, and we'll, we'll get out of here. I, already, I told Corey to go get Brad's truck. That's what we came in. And while we were wa- waiting, I hear Brad behind me say, get out of the way, Frizzell, which is, you know, cool guy. Well, he's going to get up and fight with a hole in his eye. It's cool. And, and for the cool guys in the room, you'll like this part. Brad ended up literally slamming the guy to the street and just working him over real nice, okay? And then we, Corey, Corey, or, uh, yeah, Corey comes with Brad's truck, and I throw Brad in the truck. And, that was the, and so this is 1993, and I hear the phrase for the first time, from the guy who had used brass knuckles but just got his rear whooped, he says as we're leaving to Brad, he says, you better recognize, fool. Now, I was like a Christian and trying to do this thing called logic, and I didn't understand what Brad, the guy who won the fight, was supposed to recognize about the guy who lost the fight but had used brass knuckles, right? But I kind of wish Brad would have stayed down because, and here's the truth, I had no business being there. And it was the last party I went to in my young years, those kind of parties. 
Because um, who you hang around matters. But here's the truth. Friends don't let friends stay down. And maybe you have a friend whose parents just divorced. And maybe they even say, like, ah, it's no big deal. People's parents get divorced all the time. But you, you know that they feel like they have been kicked down. Maybe you have a friend who's addicted to something or friends who've been hurt so deeply that now they hurt themselves. All of us have friends who feel abandoned, belittled, alone, and hopeless. And so I want to give you a picture from Scripture today. Um, about a group of friends who refused to let one of their friends stay down. It's a pretty familiar story in the life of Jesus. I want to read the whole thing to you. It's in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So you got your Bible app, your Bible, or you can look on the screens. I want to read this. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was home. Soon the house where Jesus was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, not even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men came, arrived, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. But they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head, and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the law, the the cynics, the religious Leaders who were sitting there, they thought to themselves, what is Jesus saying? Who can, this is blasphemy, only God can forgive sins, which is true. Which either, it says one of two things about Jesus, either he's been lying about who he is, or, whoo, Jesus is a big deal. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man, Jesus, has the authority to forgive sins on earth. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. And I believe that if you had been there that day, you wouldn't have just seen this one time paralyzed man walking through the crowd. You'd have seen four of his buddies skipping and jumping and praising God right along with him. Because friends don't let their friends stay down. So what I want to do, I want to share some wisdom about friendship in this way that we can learn from this amazing story. And the first truth is this. If you want to be a good friend, the kind of friend that doesn't allow your friends to stay down, then you need to be the friend that you wish you had. Jesus said it like this in Luke 6. He said, treat others the way you want to be treated. So when it comes to friendship, be the friend. Quit waiting on your friend to be the friend that you wish you had. You go ahead and be the friend that you wish that you had. I bet the four friends of the paralyzed man, they thought to themselves, man, what if I was paralyzed? If I was paralyzed and one of my friends could do something that could help me, I would want them to do it. And listen, you and I can be a friend that we wish that we had by asking our friend that's down by asking them questions, honest questions about why they might be down. And if they're willing to talk, then we've got to be the kind of friend that listens sincerely. Like we actually listen to our friends and you don't have to know the answers to the problems that they have. That's why you ask questions. And Usually, there's nothing you can do anyway, or even that I could do as an older adult pastor. There's nothing that we can do most of the time that will fix the problem. But there is something we can do to help them in the midst of their problem. And part of that is asking questions, letting them talk, and listening. Sometimes the most helpful thing you can say to a friend who is down is this I'm so sorry. And then that's it, and then just leave space for them in case they want to talk more. This is hard at any age. It does not, this kind of friendship doesn't get easier the older you get. As a matter of fact, I look at that, one of the reasons, I, there's a lot of reasons why I love working with people your age and I prefer it over adults, is because 
most of the time, young people, because friendships are such an important part of your life, you learn some things about friendship pretty early on. And if, and if we can unload some knowledge to you that you believe us and you're like, oh, no, that's good, that's good, you end up living out the teachings of Jesus in a more profound way than many adults. This is hard, but it's true friendship. It's the kind of friendship that you would want. So be the friend you wish you had. And then comfort or confront your friend who's down as needed. Comfort rarely comes from cliches. Like, ah, oh, well, you know, everything happens for a reason, right? Or, or like, or the Christian thing where we might say, uh, you know, hey, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'll be praying for you, which isn't really a bad thing. But I'm assuming if you'll tell a friend of yours that you'll be praying for them, I'm assuming that you're a Christian. And so how about you pray for them right then? Dude, you know, I don't know how to pray out loud. Nobody does until they learn how. You know how you learn how? Right? You do it. So like be a comforter. Listen to the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, verses 3 through 4. It says, God is our merciful Father, and he is the source of all comfort. He, God, comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, when they're down, our friend, we are able to give them the same comfort that God gave us. The word comfort that Paul, the guy who wrote this, the word comfort in that language, the Greek language, it literally means to call to your side, to summon someone alongside of you. It's to, it's to be with them. You comfort someone by being with them, not by being the answer person and giving them what you think all the answers are. Listen, being with is God's great grace. That's why God sent Jesus. Jesus had several nicknames. One of them was Emmanuel. In that language then, it meant God with us. Jesus was God coming to the earth, becoming a human, so that God could be with us. In, in essence, that God would learn what it really feels like to be human. And that God is with us. And we, you and I can reciprocate that. Big word for like, we can do that too. We, we get it from God and we, that comfort of God being with us. God doesn't fix all of our problems. God doesn't pluck you out of the pain in your life. Anybody who's been a believer for a while knows that. That's why Jesus' little brother James starts his letter in the New Testament with, hey man, and girl, consider it joy when you go through hard times because it will like create character, perseverance, right? God, God doesn't fix the problem. He's with us in the problem. And you and I, as a good friend, we can comfort people by being with them. But sometimes a friend of yours is down because of their own foolish, often sinful decisions. And when it's needed, a real friend will confront gently with the truth. Proverbs 27 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy, an enemy multiplies kisses. Telling someone what they want to hear or what you think they want to hear, that's multiplying kisses. That's not real friendship. Like, oh, you're dating that guy who has a reputation for being controlling and mean. Oh, you know what? It'll be different with you too because you're so in love, right? Or like um, you tell your friend, oh, you've been lying to your parents about that thing. Well, you know what? What, what else are you going to do? They don't understand. I mean, you got to do it. You got to lie. Now, here's the thing. That's not friendship. Because it's untrue, both of them, and it's hurtful. A real friend may have to say hard things, but they'll say hard things because they actually want what's best for their friend, not just for their friend to hear what they think they want to hear. Maybe a Christian friend of yours is clearly making sinful choices. The Bible says for a Christian to another Christian in a moment like this, the Bible says you go to them face to face. Or you go to them one on one. And you confront them gently. I know, I know phones went around, but I'm telling you, text messages, you know, trying to confront somebody, conflict, like the adult world, we do it in emails, right? You can confront someone with an email. That's not confrontation. That's cowardly. If you're going to confront a friend, you do it one on one. And Jesus says if that Christian friend continues, you confront them gently with humility 
Jesus said, be careful, man. You might be trying to go tell someone they got a two by four sticking out of their eye, when all, or sorry, that they have a speck of sawdust in their eye, but you have a two by four sticking out of your eye. So before you go and confront, you, you know, you need to make sure and have humility, be dealing with your own stuff too, but we are supposed to confront, and we do it one-on-one, -on -one, and if they don't listen, it says take another Christian friend and confront them gently with the truth, and if they still don't listen, it says bring a church leader. This is what the Bible says. I put the references there in your handout if you want to look them up. This is hard, but this is actual friendship. So I want to be a good friend. I want to confront some of you. And don't worry, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to do it with all of you at the same time. There's only a handful of you that need to hear it. And some of you that need to hear it won't hear it because you have your headphones in and your face and you're hiding behind your screens, and that's cool. I'm okay with that. But I watch many of you on the weekends, and I, I, specifically high school. And, uh, you know, you come during the weekends and you sit during the songs, which, honestly, I'm okay with. I mean, there's the part of the Missouri boy in me that, like, because, listen, none of you are more of a punk than I was at your age. I just, like, I'm just arrogant about that. I just think I could, I, I think I out-punked you, okay? But, um, but, like, the Missouri boy in me, man, like, especially when a woman asks you to stand up, I judge every one of you dudes in here that don't stand up. Not because I judge you that you don't love Jesus and want to stand for, look, I get it. I really do, I get it. I get it that most of you, when you sit during the songs, it's a message for people like me. Like, I'm not gonna do it. I don't care. I get it. That's why I don't mess with most of you in it. But I do, and, but I do talk to a lot of you young men. You know, because especially when it's Brienne or Adri. And look, I can't help it. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me as much when Jeff asks you to stand and you don't. But it just like, mm. and that's why I can't say something a lot of times one-on-one -on -one because my heart's not right. When I see some of you fellas and you don't love Jesus, cool. But you're a punk to a woman? Like, shame on you, young men. Maybe I should call you boys if you act like that. I know you're bigger than me. You can squash me easily. Trust me, I know this. But I love you. And so I'm going to say these things. And I, I don't think, though, for you it's, it's just about disrespect. I think you're too insecure. I think part of it is you just want people to know I'm not going to do it. My, and I've asked some of you, like, especially high school, I'll ask you, like, hey, why do you come to church? Like, why? You clearly are so, like, not in it. And I get it. So why do you got My mom makes me. Oh. And I've told people before, like, all 22 years of my full time being a pastor, I have told students that are honest enough to tell me that. I'm like, seriously, let me know what I can do to help you not have to come here. Not because I don't want you here. I do want you here. But, like, I know you're not going to get anything when you've got that kind of mindset. And I can't change that. I'm part of the problem in your mind, so I won't be able to. So maybe I can talk your parents in to letting you sit with them in, in big, what I call big church, right? Big people church. And that's cool. Like, seriously. What, what's crazy, though, is the people that don't have the courage to admit it. Like, why do you even come to church? Oh, I love it. It's so awesome. And the whole time, you're checked out. You just don't have the courage to say the truth. Some of you who come here often, you look so bored. You, you put, you, like, you walk in with your, and here, this kill, like, seriously, you come in with your headphones, right? So, like, you're already giving us that message, which, again, is cool. Like, I wouldn't, I, I cannot make anybody love the Lord or have good character or be respectful to women or to men. I can't do it. But, like, you just straight up. Bam, I don't even care. It's like game on the, it doesn't, I mean, I'm just going to play my, guy. like, children, man. My nine-year-old son wouldn't do it. Now, some of that's because he's got me in his head, right, and the trouble that would happen. And maybe you didn't get that, and I'm sorry. I really am. If you're courageous enough, maybe you can take it from a big brother right now, a big brother in the Lord. And not just the young men, young ladies too. You don't have to love Jesus to do that, but seriously, like, some of you I've seen and have confronted. Uh, I, I can tell you about one time in particular on a Saturday night, there was a, a young person in the very back of the room, and they were dancing to the Lord. They're doing it in the back, I'm trying to get attention. Everybody's looking up here. But some kids sitting somewhere toward the back, some high school kids were pointing at this person and making fun of them and laughing. That, of course, they were sitting down during worship. And so, and so I, you know, because I, I got to guard my heart. I, I coached football for three years back in the day, and, like, I realized, oh, oh, this is easy. This is kind of who I am. This is, like, easy. Being a pastor is hard. I've had to work. I have to work hard. 
than being a pastor. Being a football coach, like some, if some kid rolled into practice with his, I was a head freshman football coach at a public school. If some kid rolled into practice with his helmet on, but he, and he had headphones in, playing it, do, right? And here's the thing, I wouldn't care if he loved football. But if he shows up to the, to the practice or the game, you chose to show up in some manner, especially at high school age. Somebody may have made you come on campus, but you chose to come in here. But I can't, like, make you run until you throw up, right? I get sued. And so I have to, like, walk away, pray, and think about how to be nice. <laughs> Some of you are bored. Right? And I get it because we're human, because I think we are boring sometimes. Right? But do you, the cynics on the sidelines, maybe similar to those Pharisees at the house with Jesus? I know they were religious leaders, and those of you who are cynics in the room, a few of you are religious. I get that. But, but if you're a cynic on the sideline making fun of people for worshiping or whatever it is that you're checking out and too cool for whatever, like seriously, do you have this freaky, weird, messy thing called life figured out? Because if you do, you should quit making fun of us. You should come share your vast knowledge with us. Okay, I'm getting too worked up. Some of your friends need comfort. And some of your friends need to be confronted gently with the truth. Some of you need confronted. You need challenged to step up and step into faith. And then you do this. You enlist other friends. If you want to be a friend that doesn't let your friends stay down, you may need to enlist other people. I love how Mark chapter two, there were four friends because it's a lot easier to carry a paralyzed man with four of you than it is one of you or even two of you. Uh, block party just recently at our decision time. My oldest son, he was sitting with a friend who, who decided to make a decision. He would be a little nervous to go forward and Asher said, I'll, I'll go with you. And by the time they went down, the whole row went with them. Only one of them was making a decision. The whole row, pretty much the whole D group went. I was so proud, right? Not just of Asher, but of that whole group, because that's friendship to be with. And sometimes you need more than just one friend, because sometimes the problem is bigger than your friend group, than even your whole friend group. Maybe it's abuse, or they're talking about suicide. You need to then go get a trusted adult. I'm not dogging people your age. I'm saying that people your age, if you're actually wise, and you've got a friend that's in trouble, that is dangerous to themselves or to others, then of course wisdom would say you get an adult. An adult doesn't have everything you don't have. It just means that they're a little older and probably have some wisdom and probably have some power and resources to do something. Even if your friend says to you, no, you can't tell anybody. If you tell anybody, then you're not really my friend. Well, that listen, they're hurt and hurting and you may indeed lose the friendship, but if you love them as a friend, you would do the hard thing if they were in danger. As a matter of fact, I would say if they're in danger or they're a danger to other people and you don't tell an adult, then you're not their friend. You're their enemy. You're just multiplying kisses, telling them what you think they want to hear. And finally, here's the last thing. Believe. Believe that Jesus can help your friend who's down. The four friends, they had heard about Jesus and the things he had, he had done, and they bring their friend, Right? They arrive to the house. The house is packed. They can't get inside, so they leave, right? They take their friend home. What else are they going to do? No, 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 not these friends. They climb the roof. They destroy someone else's property. They dig up the roof. And, I don't, and what kind of contraption did they make? It doesn't tell us, but they lower him down in front of Jesus. And then Mark chapter 2, verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he forgives and heals the man. But wait. Whose faith did he see? I think the paralyzed man. But he saw their faith. The friends, man, look at what believing in Jesus' power can do in the life of one of your friends. But that starts with you. Do you believe that Jesus can help your friend who's down? Well, let me ask a couple other questions in a different way. Do your friends know that you follow Jesus? If you're a Christian, I don't mean do your friends know your family comes to church. Do your friends know that you're a follower of Jesus? And you don't have it all figured out, but you've given your life to Jesus. You've trusted in him. Do you share your faith and your experience of knowing Jesus, the joy and the peace and the hope that you have 
from knowing Jesus? Do you share that, especially with a friend who is down? Do you pray with your hurting friends, inviting Jesus into the actual situation? You may say that's weird. Okay. But like not just people your age, people my age too. What, do, what, what are most of the things that friends talk about? They talk about weird stuff. So why not go ahead and do a weird thing? And just instead of being like, I'll pray for you. Just be like, hey, I might be kind of weird. But you, you care if I, and listen, you, you can say that was it. But when I was your age and became a Christian, I began to do that. I got challenged with that. And it was weird. And I know that some of the prayers I prayed over really messy people, I'm sure I said things that were just wrong, right? Like not in the Bible, not true. I think Jesus is okay with that. We'll get some of that figured out as we, as we grow. Do you invite your friends here to your community of faith? If the answer is no to most of those questions, then let me ask you again, do you really believe that Jesus can help a friend who's down? Or maybe the better question is, do you even believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be? I'm going to say one more hard thing. I know I've said a few. Or at least I think they're hard. Maybe you're like, it's cool, whatever. I don't understand why anybody would even come here and check out if you have no belief at all. And I know some of you are just passive aggressive, and I don't know how to do that. And that's just personality. I'd be more aggressive. Like if I thought this was just a silly show, Bro, I, I mean, partly for entertainment. I'd just be asking people like Brian, me and Sean and Adri, like, you guys, you guys really believe in all that? Or is that just on the stage? Like, do you, do you read the Bible outside of sermons, right? Oh, no, no, okay, okay. When somebody flips you off when you're driving, do you bless them and not curse them, right? Like, seriously, do you? I'm not even going to answer. But for some of you that just passive aggressively come in here and I don't care, whatever, right? Seriously? Friends don't let friends stay down. Be the friend you wish you had. Comfort or confront as needed. Enlist other friends and believe that Jesus can help your friend who's down. I want to close with one story about my nine year old. He's almost 10. His name's Silas. Silas is me, uh, miniature, right? No facial hair, a little shorter. And uh, same personality. I love it. It's great. It's like, because I, I can see the future, right? I know how things are going to, like, just in the moments. Like, Silas, uh, I mean, he's confident in any room he comes into. He's in third grade right now. And uh, he's got a, a new kid in his class this year, this, this, this whole year. Now, I'll call him David. And David isn't just shy. I'm, as a, as a, as a non-expert therapist, right, psychologist, as a wannabe, I, I would assume that he's had some trauma in his life because he is shy and unhealthily. And, and during recess, the first part of the year, he would actually stay inside and the, the third grade teacher would have to play with him inside. And Silas, you know, told my wife and I about this. And so we began to pray with him, right? Have Silas pray for opportunities for Silas to be a friend to David. And uh, Silas began to invite him to recess and, uh, and like stand with him in line and talk to him and in class include him. And, and David kept saying no about going outside and playing. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. And a lot of Silas's friends were saying, you know, no, they weren't being mean. They are just like, Silas, I don't, he, David's never going to come outside. He's too scared. He's afraid. He's, he's shy. He won't do this. But Silas kept asking. It took several months. Long story short, David no longer stays inside for recess for months now. He doesn't just play with Silas on the recesses. He play, Silas has since taken him to all kinds of other kids. Because Silas knows everybody all the way up to sixth grade. He knows them all, right? Uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes that, that's bad. He knows the principal and everybody, right? And so, he, so he's got now all these friends. And recently in a class assignment, they had to write about someone who was an influence in their life. And David wrote about his friend Silas who helps him feel safe at school. That was his words from a third grader. And Silas, I got a picture, he got an award, a teacher award uh, this last month uh, for citizenship and integrity. And the note said, Silas went out of his way to help a classmate feel secure and welcome. And I, I, I made sure not to say all of this to Silas for reasons that'll probably make sense, but I told Amy, his mom, uh, yeah, I, I don't care 
if Silas gets F's all the way through school. I don't care <laughs> if he becomes a great athlete, but if this kid can do this for the rest of his life and, and leverage his personality and his kind of like walk in a room and be the life of the party, if he can continue to, because I want that to become an identity marker for him because he needs things to like be like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's, that's who I am. I want him to be the friend that he wish he had because the truth is Silas got a lot of good things going for him. He's fell into a lot of, you can call it luck, blessings, whatever. And so I don't want that to just be for him. I want that to be for every single friend that he ever has. And I want that to be true for every friend that you have. So Lord Jesus, I would pray over my younger brothers and sisters here in this room. I, I want to thank you, God, for their grace for sitting and listening to me. Maybe vent a little bit, but hopefully confront with some truth. But also, God, I pray, I pray for the young man or young woman who is hurting, who is down, and maybe feeling like they're alone and, and abandoned and forgotten. Jesus, I pray that you would send a, a Silas friend to them. I pray that they would meet someone here who would be with them, who would be the friend they wish they had. And Lord, I pray for the, the Christian students in this room who have a friend right now who's especially down. I pray you give them wisdom on how to be the friend they know they need to be how to get advice and counsel from adults that they trust when it's needed, how to comfort and confront as needed. But God, may we believe in this place, or maybe, God, may we have a crisis of faith. May there be a few crises of faith in this place today where there's some students questioning, do, do I even believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, or what, what do I believe? God, I pray for that young man or that young woman. I pray that you would encourage their hearts. I pray that more than anything, they'd get even a glimpse that you are here with them and that you love them deeply and dearly. Jesus, I pray all this with great hope in your name. Amen.